My name is Mario Vitale, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends Jake, Maggie, and Naomi, and we're talking about La Cucina Italiana. And today we're making a little bit of a departure. We're going to actually make something that I almost claim never to exist. That's right, Italian desserts. <laughs> we're going to make things that are very simple, very much part of the Italian vernacular, but you'll understand when we taste these that the Italians don't make such a big thing about it. They tend not to make souffles. And in fact, today we're going to make a ciambella, then we're going to make a zabaglione, then we're going to make little pine nut cookies, and then we're going to finish it all with little clementines with vinegar and pepper. Mm. <laughs> now, the first thing you have to realize when you're making desserts is that often enough, the Italian culture really doesn't eat their dessert at the end of the lunch or at the end of the dinner. They tend to eat their desserts in the middle of the afternoon because that's when Grandma gets the opportunity to break out a little bit of vin santo <laughs> and get going at 4 o'clock. So that's what this first one is. And uh, They would serve it at the end of the meal sometimes, but it's not the reason this exists. And a lot of the desserts are kind of dry, cakey little things that really need that vin santo to be dipped into. But we're going to make one with just a little bit of berries, and this would be one that you'd make in the, I don't know, the middle of summer when you have your raspberries, your blackberries, any kind of berries you can find. If it was grapes or if it was anything other than that, it would all be fine. The whole idea behind understanding great Italian cooking is that the substitution something is, is exactly what we're looking for. It's what you want to do. So if you couldn't find any of these, use something else. You could use pieces of orange. You could make an applesauce out of this. The potential is endless. So we're just going to make a little sauce just by putting these berries in here. A little bit of sugar, a little bit of lemon juice. Anybody can make this at home. Now the cake itself is called the ciambella because it's a ring. And we're going to form it into a ring, but it's easy to do. And we're going to use the food processor. And we're going to take two and a half cups of flour, one cup of sugar, a teaspoon of baking powder, and eight tablespoons of sweet butter cut into little cubes and relatively soft. Not room temperature, but softer than ice cold. And then we're just going to zap it like that. So this is what the pastry chefs do all day, huh? Do they stay later on at the restaurant? They get there earlier and they leave right... Well, actually, the, the pastry plater at the restaurant is the person that has to close the restaurant because they have to wait till the last person has their dessert. Mm. But the pastry chef's also the first person to get in. So it's a thankless long job. <laughs> then what we're going to do is we're going to make this into a dough. We're going to take a third of a cup of milk, one egg, and the tiniest little bit of almond extract. If you didn't have almond extract, any one of those fancy liqueurs that you have around the house, uh, amaretto, any one of those kind of sweet ones would work. It's just a flavoring and it's not that big of a deal. Now we're going to go until it just forms that ball right there. That's where you want to stop it. You don't want to overwork this because in developing the gluten while working through the flour, what you would develop would be something that would be firm and kind of hold its shape like bread, which is what we want it to do if it's bread. But not if it's a cake or a pastry. We want it to be tender and flaky like a biscuit. So if you're familiar with ever making anything like biscuits or muffins, they'll always tell you in the instructions to just bring it together and not stir it too much. They'll tell you, stir for one minute as opposed to 45 minutes that, or 45 or 45 beats or whatever it is, longer than a minute is going to develop the gluten. And what that gluten does is it causes it to be firm, which is not where you want to be. Now, we're going to take a little bit of what we call bench flour. This came together already in there. Had you done this in the style of the grandma, if we were actually making this in Italy, we would have put all the ingredients on the table. We would have dug our little well there. We would have done it in the center, which is what we want to do. Then we would have brought all the ingredients together, and it would have happened just about as easily or as quickly as this. Then we're going to take this dough that we have here, and without working it too much, form it into a dough. Is it called bench flour because it's made out of benches? <laughs> Yes, it's finely ground benches, and we leave them there. No, it's because we put it on the bench, silly. And that's, I mean, you know, when you talk about technical terms in the kitchen, they're very simply based, very much like your joke just was. <laughs> so now we roll it out like that, and basically just form it into, this is why it's called a ciambella, because ciambella means it's kind of a ring shape. Then we just put it on a greased cookie sheet. And when I say greased, I'm talking about a greased cookie sheet. And then we dust it with just a little bit more sugar to kind of form that crust. Will it burn? The sugar will actually... In the the sugar will actually, in its own little way, at this point, because we're not going to cook it for a long time, is just going to kind of form this kind of glisten over the top. And if you wanted it to look matte, then you wouldn't put any sugar on it at all. You just allow it to kind of sit there. But in this case, we're actually going to put that sugar on, and it will turn kind of shiny. 
Sometimes they put egg whites, right? Or something. Egg whites, if you want it to get glistening. Mm -hmm. Egg yolks, if you want it to turn a dark, more golden brown. Mm -hmm. And egg wash, if you want it to be both. Mm -hmm. But generally, the protein in the egg is what turns that kind of really dark golden brown. If you want something that's not going to cook very long to turn much browner much more quickly, it's going to be an egg yolk wash. So then this goes in the oven at 400 degrees for about 20 minutes. And then you come over here and you make sure that your sauce is going good. And that's it. There's nothing in there but sugar. Not even Lemon that much juice. sugar, just a little bit of sugar. So the liquid in the berries. The liquid in the berries starts coming out as soon as you give it direct heat. And this is a, a good way to make any kind of these compotes. It's very simple. Just bring it up to the boil and then allow it to simmer for just seconds. You really don't need to cook it very long. Because if you cook things for a long time, you get that cooked fruit flavor, which is good. That's what pies are supposed to be about. But in something like this, which is just a little compote, you like that rawness to it. There's almost a, a kind of a brightness and acidity to it that you want to leave alone. When we come back, I'll show you how to bring the whole, well, not even that much of a step together. We'll bring these three things together and then we'll start making a little zabaglione, so stay with us. Ooh. Hey, welcome back. Now, I've got our little chambella here, and you can tell it's gotten just the tiniest little glisten there. To add to its glisten effect, we're going to add just a little bit more sugar like that. Mm -hmm. And then, you take your compote, or your blackberry summer of love, <laughs> and you take it, and here's what, here's what makes it look really cool. Oh... This is almost like a cookie. Exactly. It actually tastes, you'll see, when we cut this, oh, it's going to be like a cookie. Uh, and this kind of volcanic this, <laughs> thing of juice. Oh, oh. come on. Come on. Oh, look at that. For, for a young fellow like me who grew up in Washington State, this is as good as it's going to get. <laughs> Just because any, I mean, you could take my shoes after working in the kitchen all day and put this kind of blackberry thing on top. <laughs> We're good. Yeah. We're good to go. And then you just carve it up like so. And maybe you'll serve the sauce on the side if you don't think that all of your friends are going to finish it. Because then you'd want to save a little bit for Grammy. Oh, my God. Naomi? Thank you. This, is, this would make a fine Italian breakfast, too, this, wouldn't this, it? Uh, um, this is something you eat immediately. A lot of the things... No, this would actually... Well, if, 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 if this was Italy, this thing would have sat out for like three days until it was really kind of hard, almost like a biscotti. And then... They would serve it with this raspberry stuff to dip in mm. with a little bit of wine on the side. It looks like uh. an Italian omelette. Exactly. Omelette with blackberries. Black there you go. Thank General you. food should be eaten at more room temperature. than. Very right. good question. Yes, in fact, a lot of Italian food is served not out of the refrigerator and not directly out of the oven. It's important for them to know that the palate isn't being attacked by the heat. So they want something that's not... They, they're not going to eat their fish at room temperature, but they're going to eat it maybe at 130 as opposed to 350 that it comes off the grill because they want it warm, but they don't want it really, really too hot because too hot burns your tongue and too cold you can't taste anything. Now, what we're going to start here is some sugar syrup to make pine nut cookies or pinocate. Yeah. And what we're going to do is we're going to take four cups of sugar and one cup of water. And this is something that has always intimidated... Us basically savory. Is that all right over there, guys? I can't hear you anymore. Okay, good. Ma, 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 ma. He's talking about something. So what you want to do with this sugar to create something that's going to become a clear liquid is you want to stir it around with actually without actually stirring it with a spoon and try to get it to dissolve. And you'll watch this carefully. And what you want to bring it to is about 250 degrees, which I'm working on right here. And right now it seems to have gone over a little bit. That's not going to kill me. I'm going to now turn that heat off and let it go. But that's what this would have done had I just stirred through and stuck my thermometer right in there like that. So I'm going to let that cool. When I come back to that in a few minutes, without letting it become cool, cool, I'm going to make some cookies. Now, here we're going to make zabaglione, the standard red sauce Italian classic, the kind of thing we sing about on TV. And it's just very simple to make, and it's something that a lot of people are intimidated by. And you can serve it hot or cold. We're going to serve it hot today. And we're just going to take egg yolks, and we're not going to serve them raw. We're going to serve them cooked. This is something that you can make at home. Although I'm using a copper bowl, a glass bowl would be fine. A metal kitchen bowl is fine. The reason you like a copper bowl is if you're going to make a mistake, which I can do often enough, is if you really thought that it was starting to scramble, you would immediately take the copper bowl and put it on top of an ice bath. And that would slow down the cooking process and give you yet another, a second chance 
not to botch your dessert. Now the trick here is to just put sugar, I'm going to say a teaspoon per yolk, and then we're going to take Marsala wine, because this is traditionally made in, this is from Sicily. Well, that one's not going to work. Let's find another one. Dun, da, 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 da. There we go. We're going to take a little marsala, and I'm going to say another tablespoon per. And if you add more liquid at this point, you'll, sub you'll see that it becomes a little bit softer. If you want your zabaglione to be very firm, there's two ways to get there. Put no liquid in whatsoever and cook it right over the top, or cook it a little bit longer. Now, the trick to getting this, yes? Why do these bowls have no flat bottoms? Because they're going to sit over a double boiler. Okay. This isn't meant to sit anywhere. This is meant to actually cook with. So the first thing you do is you think, all right, suspension or emulsion? Big question when you're dealing with <laughs> eggs. We're going for the suspension. What we're going to do is suspend air in there. If you were making a mayonnaise or a hollandaise, you'd actually be emulsifying, which is something where the acidity or some liquid becomes part of the sauce by actually bonding to the fat. This is something where we just want to suspend. So what we're going to do is just at the very beginning here, and watch out because when I'm whisking, the stuff is flying. <laughs> and what you want to do is start to form air here. And you're going to keep your little towel here. Careful. You're going to keep your towel here because if it starts to look like it's setting right there on the bottom of the bowl, you want to pull it off and just allow it to cool because you're whisking in air. Why copper? Now at this point, what? Why copper? Copper actually transfers heat the quickest. It's the best transfer of heat. And as you can tell right now, it's already starting to get a little bit more viscous. And I want to be careful not to cook it to the scramble point, but I want to bring it to its reality. And that's just by whisking like so. And if you have this copper bowl, you can do it here in real time, just like I'm making it right now. Oh, it's flying. Now look, pull it off and just let it cool for a second because I'm going to want it to be able to sit on top there. And you keep going and you keep going. And this is something. Now at this point, you could cool it and let it set and it will kind of, uh, deflate just a little bit and serve a cooled zabaglione, or you can keep cooking it like I'm doing right now, and then allow it to cool over an ice bath, whisking the entire time, and then whisk, whisk in an equal portion of whipped cream, and then to cool that down too. But now as you can see, it's really coming together just like a pudding, which is exactly where we want it. And then what you do is sing Puccini or Verde, come to the table just like Mama Leone, just like that, and there you have it, a beautiful hot zabaglione. Oh, wow. Huh? Oh, wow. And that look cool, and you can make it at home in real time, and you don't even need one of these fancy copper bowls. What you might need, though, is a little bit of Marcella to drink with it. Mm. When we come back, I'm serving that up, baby. When we come back, we'll be serving that up, and we'll also be getting down and getting funky with those Pinot Cate. So stay with us. Welcome back. Now, with that zabaglione, I would like to also serve some beautiful little walnut shortbreads. <gasps> Careful, they'll break. They'll break. They're delicious. And these are an easy, quick recipe of walnut wow. shortbread where you take walnuts and flour 50-50, mix it up with your uh, butter and sugar, and then just form it into that little dough. And that's another one of those things that are very easy to make. Now, yeah. our pine nut cookies, oh, we have our oh, sugar. No. Aren't those delicious? Mm -hmm. And dipped. Mm -hmm. And dipped, oh, the whole game. Yeah. Now, the pine nut cookies are made with frutti canditi, which is to say this kind of strange amalgamation of stuff <laughs> that they use in Sicily and in, in, in parts unknown. It's something that always frightened me, probably due to my probable misunderstanding of the fruitcake concept. And the fruitcake is made with a lot of this stuff here and with kind of a weedy, molassesy, treacly, flowery thing going on. But they actually taste pretty good in this way. And the way we have it is we've made this kind of a simple syrup that we're bringing up to 240 degrees. That is exactly where we want it to be because what's going to happen when I throw this stuff in is it's going to immediately start to set. So you have to be both emotionally and physically prepared to make these <laughs> cookies at the exact same time. So what we'll do is, well, this is what they call in French mise en place. In, in, in America, we just call it getting it together. So we have that. We're going to turn that off. And now we're going to throw in 
in two quick moves our frutti canditi and our pine nuts. Now we're using untoasted pine nuts because we don't want this to be too intensely pine nutty, but we want, we want the pine nut flavor, but if you toast it, if you're familiar with that, anything that you tend to toast will become more exaggerated of the same flavor. I'm gonna add all those pine nuts and all those fruit candies. And we don't want that in these cookies. Now at this point, the time, the clock is working against us. So now what we have to do, before this whole thing sets, is take this and just put them on here. So these are, these are kind of like no-bake cookies. And you could, actually those are probably, knowing the intensity of this candied fruit, I would say that is a large one. That'll be Jake's birthday cookie right there, <laughs> the really big one. And then what you do is you just, we've taken absolutely unfettered, untouched wax paper, and you want to spoon these out like so, and you're thinking, well, what, what's up with that recipe, chef? I don't see anything <laughs> going on there. Well, in fact, that's the main point here, that in Italian dessert cooking, a lot of this stuff is, again, more all about the product. It's about the pine nuts and the quality of your frutti canditi. Why pine nuts? Well, that's the basic recipe, but you could use any nut for, for that matter. I mean, if we, were, if we were in Georgia, we could use peanuts. We could use walnuts. We could use hazelnuts. But this is a traditional pinocate from Pignoli. Why isn't this a candy? Huh? Isn't, it, isn't this really a candy? Well, this is really a candy, but I'm calling them cookies because... You like to. It's my show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they refer to... These, are more, these aren't biscotti. Biscotti are what they really call cookies. These are actually served at the time that cookies are served, not necessarily candies. Although kids, sneaky kids will get into those. Now we're gonna let those cool, and what they're gonna happen is that, that clear caramel or that clear sugar liquid is gonna turn just a little bit foggy. Then we'll dust it with a little powdered sugar and it'll be delicious. Now, an unlikely combination of fruit and vinegar mm. to make a great dessert. So what we're gonna take is, I'm gonna take a little bit of this zest, and I'm gonna take it off it before I get into the fruit. And I always do this with any citrus fruit I ever use. I get the zest off because that's the intensified flavor of it. If you're familiar with the fruit, the outside, the very orange color itself tastes just like the fruit inside. And then the pith, when you get to the white stuff, tastes the bitter. So you want to make sure that you don't become a zealot and overgrade it. And we're going to take that off and just give it like that. Then we're going to actually remove what they call in French cooking the Supremes. And the way you do that is you take a sharp knife and you cut across like that then around the edges like so to just remove all of that white and what you're leaving here and this works best with seedless fruit but even seedy pithy older squishy fruit will work just as well and what you want to do is just get those off like that and this is something that again when we're talking about in Italian food they're very temperature sensitive and although I myself love a stinging cold clementine out of the refrigerator at breakfast time Italians are perplexed by that about me. <laughs> as, as many other things that we won't talk about on this show. But what you want to do now is just saw down between the little segments here and get these perfect little clementine segments just like if you were at a fancy hotel for say your birthday. <laughs> How do you make sure they don't all fall? You know a lot of times you cut an orange and it falls apart. Like that one just did right there? <laughs> yeah, like that. Well you just kind of hold on to it gently and just keep working. The key is to have a nice sharp knife. If you have the sharp knife, then it's very easy to do. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take balsamic vinegar, and we're not talking about the salad balsamic vinegar. There's Balsamic vinegar is made in Modena, Italy, as well as in Reggio Emilia, and it's all kind of monitored by this giant consortium. And what they do is the vinegar makers all live wherever, they live it, w within the geographical origin of Modena, the town, which is in Emilia Romagna. And they make this vinegar by taking these white Trebbiano grapes and they put it in these, they harvest it, then they press it before they ferment it, and they take this juice and they put it in these giant copper pots. Then they put the giant copper pots on an open fire and they boil it down till anywhere between 40 or 60 percent away. It's gone. And that's called mosto. They take that mosto and they put it in these giant barrels, huge barrels, 80, 100 gallon barrels. And then every year they take it and they put it into a smaller barrel of a different kind of wood. At the end of 12 years, they've got it down to these little barrels and they bring it to a, a sample of it to this consortium of tasters in Spilamberto where they look at it and taste it and they give it a point rating of anywhere from X0 to 250 points. Well, if it's above 250 point, uh, if it's above 220 points, they're allowed to put it in the bottle, the official consortium bottle, and sell it as Aceto Balsamico di Modena. Well, this is the stuff I'm talking about and it costs 40 or $50 for a little jar like this, but it's something that you don't toss on your salad. It's something that's a very special occasion and you put just a little anointment on something like fresh fruit like this or a perfectly boiled piece of beef or a chicken that's perfectly cooked and what you do is you just take a little bit like so 
and you drizzle maybe a teaspoon on the whole thing. Then we take black pepper and put quite a little taste of that in there. Why pepper and not, you know... Uh, Wait till you taste it. Right. I'm telling you, it's something that's going to work. We're going to put a couple of these on there. If you wanted to put a little bit of vanilla ice cream on top of there, that would make absolute sense. When we come back, we'll eat this, we'll taste and finish our cookies or our candies, and we'll talk a little bit about Malvasia, so stay with us. Now the zest goes sprinkled just over the top, a little bit more pepper, and there you have it. Oh, a little bit of the clementines with balsamic mm. and black pepper. Thank you. Now the pine nut cookies get taken right off the sheet, remember they were never really cooked, so you just arrange them by plying them off the top of the sheet and just on the top of something festive like so. And then the only way to make yeah. these even cooler is more sugar. <laughs> so oh what my we'll God. do. This is really good. This is Isn't really that cool? Good. Now the we'll pepper. just spank this over oh. like that. I now understand why you use the pepper. Balsamic, and the, mm. right, the pepper makes all the sense mm. in the world. Mm. Then what you want to do is just serve it up with a little bit of Malvasia, a semi-sweet mm. dessert wine from Sicily, and that is the whole game, Italian desserts in a nutshell. I want to thank you guys for being here. You've made it a heck of a lot of fun. Yes. I want to thank you guys for being here. <laughs> See you next time. Happy holidays. Go, go, go.